Hello, and welcome to The Daily Space. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. Before we get to our regular show, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to all of you who are part of the CosmoQuest Hangout-a-thon this past weekend. Thanks to your generosity during this 36-hour fundraiser, we were able to raise over $40,000. These funds will support not just this show, but all the shows put out by CosmoQuest, including 365 Days of Astronomy, Astronomy Cast, The Weekly Space Hangout, and more. Thank you. Your help is going to allow us to keep bringing you science and awesome guests like today's Dr. Margaret, Dr. Margaret Meixner, the Director of Science Mission Operations for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA Telescope. She'll be joining us later on in the show. But first, the news. And now for some science, or at least a pretty picture that contains a lot of information that yields amazing discoveries. The Zwicky Transient Facility recently discovered a star going supernova in a field the test planet hunter just happened to be observing. Recognizing a unique opportunity to catch a supernova going off in a field that was being actively observed in the time leading up to the blast, the Hubble Space Telescope pulled off its normal planned observations and directed itself at this special event. The supernova went off in the butterfly galaxies, a beautiful pair of merging systems located about 60 million light years away. The fact is, this is such a scientifically interesting merger and beautiful merger that uh, there are lots of observations of this system and the star that went supernova going all the way back to the 1990s. This combination of historic data taken multiple times with the Hubble over 30 years, combined with data from tests taken every 30 minutes in the days leading up to the discovery, combined with Hubble data taken right after the supernova went off, the supernova, officially named SN2020 FQV, is now referred to as the Rosetta Stone of Supernovae. According to observer Ryan Foley, we used to talk about supernova work like we were crime scene investigators, where we would show up after the fact and try to figure out what happened to that star. This is a different situation because we really know what's going on and we actually see the death in real time. This is really the most detailed view of stars like this in the last moments and how they explode. These observations may even allow us to develop an early warning system to identify the next star that is about to die. The sky is vast, and it's very rare that we just happen to be looking in the right direction by accident to catch something amazing. Luckily, we often get hints of here lies the remarkable. Recently, astronomers observed the variable star GQ Lupi's giant planet, or possibly brown dwarf companion. It's hard to tell because this is a young system still forming. And because it's a young system still forming that has a giant planet, or brown dwarf, they were able to ask, how do the moon systems of Jupiter-like worlds form and get an answer? Direct imaging using the Very Large Telescope in Chile was able to make out a warm disk around the Jupiter-like object, and it seems to indicate that moons, moons form in a disk around the planet, just as planets form in a disk around the star. While the Very Large Telescope is the best telescope we have today, team lead Thomas Stolker pointed out that Webb can take spectra at mid-infrared wavelengths. That is very challenging from Earth. In doing so, we could learn much more about the physical and chemical processes in the disk of GQ Lupi B that may enable the formation of moons. Here is to hoping that JWST finally gets off this planet and lets us start looking at other worlds. This work is published in the Astronomical Journal. It's kind of amazing that we've really only been in the planet finding business since 1995 from barely being able to detect worlds from how they move their stars, we've now evolved our technology to be able to directly image planets. 
In new data from the Subaru Telescope in Hawaii, researchers caught sight of the youngest planet directly imaged to date. Dubbed 2M0437, this planet is about 100 times the Earth-Sun distance from its star, and researchers estimate that it is a few times bigger than Jupiter. According to lead author Eric Gatos, by analyzing the light from this planet, we can say something about its composition, and perhaps where and how it formed in a long-vanished disk of gas and dust around its host star. Before we go to break, we have one final bit of news. The Saturn system has grown in number of known moons. Observations with the 2.6 meter Canada France Hawaii telescope in Hawaii has brought the number of known moons up to 82. And researchers now estimate that there are 150, give or take 30, moons larger than 2.8 kilometers orbiting the ringed planet. That is a lot of moons. After the break, we'll be back to discuss planet searching. Archimedes fa famously said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Luckily, no such lever or fulcrum has been placed, so our world keeps safely orbiting. This is a case where the physics of the saying is true, but the reality of what we humans and our engineering allows doesn't allow us to take advantage of this physics. There are a lot of cases like this. For instance, to measure the distance to an object using basic trigonometry, we need to be able to observe the object from two separate positions. Humans use two eyeballs to perceive distances to objects around us. Astronomers use the Earth's motion around the sun to get measurements of the distance to nearish stars. Our ability to measure distances is only limited by where we can observe from. Give us two measurements far enough apart, and we could measure the distance to anything in the visible universe. And this is where the Cleopatra mission comes in. Written out, this acronym stands for Contemporaneous Lensing Parallax and Autonomous Transient Assay. And the plan is to stick this awkwardly named mission that luckily abbreviates to Cleopatra, to stick this mission on a ride out toward Mars and a future Mars on a future Mars mission. It will be placed in a solar orbit that will allow it to make coordinated observations with the planned Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope to observe objects. Acting as two eyes, this pair of systems will allow researchers who spot rogue planets to figure out their distance. According to mission scientist Richard Berry, the parallax signal should then permit us to calculate quite precise masses for these objects, thereby increasing scientific return. Now, this story somewhat buries the lead. I said this mission will help measure the distance to rogue planets. These are planets that have been flung out of their star systems at some point in the past and now lurk between the stars. They can be seen when they ever so briefly pass in front of a distant star and gravitationally increase the amount of light we can see. This is only possible for a brief moment in time and in the past observations didn't allow us to measure distances to these objects. Well, with Cleopatra out there, we have that farther apart pair of telescopes that makes measuring greater distances possible. Rogue planets are one thing, but this next story could be a massive discovery. Scientists using the ESA's XMM Newton and NASA's Chandra X-ray telescopes may have found a planet in another galaxy. Not surprisingly, the methods that work for finding exoplanets here in the Milky Way, like transits and gravitational shifts, don't work when looking at another galaxy because the visible light is hard to break apart into objects. But X-rays work really well since there are far fewer objects that shine in X-ray light, so the data collected can be analyzed to differentiate between a variety of X-ray sources. In this case, scientists looked for X-ray binaries, 
which are pairs of objects such as a neutron star or black hole and a so-called donor star whose material is being pulled in by the denser object. The acceleration of the infalling star stuff produces bright X-rays. And as lead author Roseanne DiStefano explains, X-ray binaries may be ideal places to search for planets because although they are a million times brighter than our sun, the X-rays come from a very small region. In fact, the source that we studied is smaller than Jupiter, so a transiting planet could completely block the light from the X-ray binary. And that's what the astronomers observed in the Whirlpool Galaxy while looking at an X-ray binary named M51-ULS-1. A light dip blocked the X-ray signal for a few hours before coming back. Of course, that didn't automatically mean this is a planet. The team had to rule out a bunch of other options like dust, a small star, or even variability from the source itself. They even had to rule out that it was the source star passing in front of the dense object. Now, DiStefano clarifies, we can only say with confidence that it doesn't fit any of our other explanations. So don't go counting your extragalactic planets until they've really been confirmed. This work is published in Nature Astronomy, and the news is exciting because it almost mirrors the discovery of the first exoplanet, which is found orbiting a pulsar, and it was observed in the X-ray wavelengths as well. Perhaps we are starting to see a new field in astrophysics. After the break, we're going to speak with Dr. Margaret Meixner, Director of Science Mission Operations for the SOFIA Telescope, about some of the amazing results their instruments have been a part of this past year. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Joining us now is Dr. Margaret Meixner, the Director of Science Mission Operations for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA Telescope, and Soraya Faruqi, the Directoral Director of External Communications for the University's Space Research Association. Dr. Meixner provides scientific, technical, and management guidance for the SOFIA team while working in partnership with the Deutsche SOFIA Institute. Soraya handles the media and press communications for the SOFIA team. The SOFIA telescope is a 2.7 meter reflecting telescope installed on board a modified Boeing 747 SP aircraft, which flies at 38,000 to 45,000 feet and puts SOFIA above 99% of Earth's infrared blocking atmosphere. Over the past year, SOFIA has enabled the discovery of water on the moon, the mapping of magnetic fields in the Whirlpool Galaxy, and the measurement of atomic oxygen in our own atmosphere, to mention just a few results. It's truly an amazing observatory. Thank you, Dr. Meixner and Soraya for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you for, thank you so much for having us. We're thrilled to be here and talk about Sophia. So I, I am, I follow the Sophia mission closely. Um, I have not flown on Sophia, but I have actually been on Sophia for a tour. And uh, of course, I also work with the SETI Institute where we have the Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors Program. And so I, I know you guys are probably familiar with that as well. So it's, a, it's an exciting program for me on several different levels. Uh, as far as all of the work that has been done over the past year, which is impressive given the circumstances alone, um, can you kind of give us a roundup of some of what you've had to get through to get things done? Oh, yes, yes. This has been uh, a challenging year, although you know, we always look at challenges as opportunities. Um, as you know, uh, SOFIA is a human crewed mission. And so to take the observations, we need a crew of people uh, to operate the telescope, uh, have a, you know, mission directors orchestrate all the um, activities. It's sort of like a, a symphony going on with all everyone playing their parts and it all has to come together. And this human crewed mission did something, in my opinion, heroic during this pandemic. Uh, they figured out how to get together and operate Sophia safely. Safety first, uh, for Sophia. And they figured out new operational procedures using N95 masks and, and screens and stuff to protect themselves uh, during the pandemic and execute not just one, but two deployments uh, abroad. One, they went to Germany, Cologne um, last February, uh, mm -hmm. and they went to French Polynesia to get some Southern targets um, in the months of July into August. Um, and uh, they got some fabulous data 
um, using the great, the heterodyne receiver, which is a, a German built instrument. Uh, we learned a lot about how stars impact and the feedback um, into their environments. Feedback's a very important element of galaxy and stellar evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, uh, they also learned about um, the first types of compounds, the most fundamental molecules in the universe, hydrides, light hydrides, have their, um, their lines visible in Sophia's wavelength range and only in Sophia, Sophia's wavelength range. So you can learn a lot about these first compounds in the universe using Sophia. Uh, and so they investigated those also. You learn a lot about the interstellar medium, its composition, how much molecular gas there is with these unique compounds. So uh, those, those are papers that are sort of in the brewing, those data were collected. But in my opinion, um, this heroic effort done by all the partners, uh, NASA, DLR, DSI, a USRA, um, which is the University Space Research Association, which employs me and operates SMO. Uh, it, it shows how cohesive and effective this team is um, in executing these during, during this pandemic. It, it just really impressed me um, as a director coming in. So can you explain to our audience just a few basics about SOFIA and the instrumentation on board? I mentioned that there's a telescope, it's a modified plane, but why infrared? Why is this important and how did this come about? Right, yes. So uh, SOFIA uh, taps into a wavelength range that is truly important in astronomy. It's about more than, more than half, most of the light from galaxy stars and planets come in this wavelength range. Uh, that is, uh, you know, long words of what Hubble gives us and short words, what we can get from ground-based telescopes. And as you mentioned in, in your introduction, uh, the problem is we have the Earth's atmosphere, which protects us humans, which is good. You have all these water vapors and atmospheric protectants, but you need to get above it to actually see this important wavelength range. Mm. Um, and uh, Sophia has a host of instruments, which we can operate one at a time. Um, and uh, one thing we specialize in a lot is high spectral resolution instruments that really can pick out lines and actually study the dynamics and kinematics of the gas, the interstellar medium gas um, in, in galaxies and in star formation regions. Uh, these are the GREAT instrument and uh, the EXES instrument. Both are for this high spectral resolution and these instruments are, are big, they're complex, um, and so they complement um, by putting it in the aircraft. This is something the SOFIA aircraft can uniquely support. They complement the types of information astronomers get in other facilities. Uh, we also um, do photometry and measure magnetic fields. So the Hawk Plus instrument studies uh, what we call the farther infrared, so the very cold components of the interstellar mm -hmm. medium. And by mapping the dust, uh, you can learn not only the direction of the magnetic field, but how strong it is. And this is providing basically a new window for astronomers to learn how, uh, how the universe operates. Uh, it's a fundamental unknown for astronomers. How do magnetic fields contribute, hinder, or promote star formation? And Sophia is able to actually reveal this information to astronomers and gives them a very important tool to understand these processes. Um, and so some of the results that Soraya showed you or sent to you had to do with uh, measuring magnetic fields in nearby galaxies. Mm -hmm. They're able to map um, to see how the structure is. They can learn about the evolution of magnetic fields and get insights into how magnetic fields may have shaped galaxy evolution over cosmic time. Uh, it's really providing a brand new and concrete information to astronomers. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have the forecast instrument. You mentioned water on the moon. There are certain wavelength ranges um, and there's a particular line that's completely opaque um, from the ground that you can only see in, uh, from the airborne aircraft uh, to show you that uh, the measurements on the moon surface, um, they see a trace of water um, on the sunlit surface of the moon. Uh, and that has produced such huge excitement uh, it supports other NASA missions like Viper and Artemis. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, um, they're actually going back. Uh, some of the observations we did this past year was to go back and do a pilot program to see um, 
what they might find with mapping larger portions of the moon. And there's ambitions to map the whole surface of the moon using SOFIA. So how do these missions, how do you choose what gets uh, uh, basically telescope type? Right, yes. Uh, well, we are uh, you know, a NASA run mission as all great observatories, we have a peer review process so astronomers from around the world, everyone's invited to offer their ideas through what they call a proposal. We collect all the proposals and we have a um, review process where we distribute the proposals to peers who evaluate the science merit and they choose the best science. Uh, and they provide recommendations to me as director of like here, these are the best science. And we look at how we can schedule it all together uh, mm -hmm. And that's how we select the program. So it's a very rigorous uh, process. Uh, we have a high, high demand for the observatory. We get um, up to five times more proposals than we can accommodate. Um, and uh, we try to do as many as we can because the, uh, you know, unfortunately you can't do all the great science uh, in one year, but uh, we have a very dedicated uh, community and uh, you know, they come back and, and continue to ask. So we are building the community uh, and, and diversifying it. And um, we're very excited about Sophia's future and what it's gonna reveal. All right, I wanna talk to you about some of the, the science results you've had over the past year, but first we're gonna take a quick commercial break. Okay. All right, welcome back. Once again, I am joined by uh, Dr. Margaret Meixner from the Sophia Telescope and Soraya Faruqi from USRA. Uh, Soraya, how, what was the motivation by just sending out a list of everything that has been done? I mean, it's a huge list. It's an impressive list. Um, we've covered some of these individually. So what, what was the motivation to say, hey, do you wanna do something on the whole project? Well, <clears throat> When we uh, were looking at, uh, you know, at the accomplishments of Sophia over the past year, we saw that these were really impressive, impressive achievements. Mm -hmm. And we thought that, you know, instead of just keeping it to ourselves, we ought to really share these achievements. And so we decided that, okay, we'll go ahead and, you know, publicize it and let people know what Sophia has been doing. So that was one of the motivations to, you know, share this, this knowledge that we had about Sophia and what Sophia had done in this past year. Of course, there's also a lot more Sophia has done over the several previous years, but we just limited ourselves to a few uh, 10, I guess, items that Sophia had accomplished this particular year in the last year. 10, 10 is a lot for Sophia in a year. So that's actually really exciting. Uh, Dr. Meixner, what is out of these, these 10 that I've, I have been looking at, what is your personal favorite on the list right now? Oh my goodness. You're asking me what my favorite child is. I can't. Do that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I have to say, I love them all. Um, but which one would you like me to talk about? Uh, how did the water on the moon uh, research come about? I seem to recall that that was almost an off the cuff kind of research project uh, because of the pandemic. That was sort of a, we need to be able to do something and that we have this opportunity. So let's use it. Right. But we do have, uh, you asked about how, um, what, how observing opportunities are made available. We have this peer review process, but we also have what we call director's discretionary time, uh, where uh, someone has sort of an idea they want to try out, kind of a high risk thing, or if there is, uh, you know, something they need that's timely, like a supernova goes off or something. So we have these opportunities and uh, this is my predecessor. I have to give credit to my predecessor, um, Dr. Hal York, who was director at the time, but um, the team that did the moon project uh, that was published this past year, uh, they had an interest in trying this out. And so it was accepted on a director's discretionary time uh, and it was, you know, basically the Sophia team, this is another remarkable thing about Sophia, because it's an airborne observatory, you can make changes to the mm -hmm. instruments and how you operate the instruments in a very fast fashion. Um, it, 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 it's one of the advantages Sophia has. They had to create a new observation mode to support these moon observations. And they, and they did. 
they uh, came up with um, kind of more of a scanning and how do you point when you're looking at the moon. A lot of software work went into this. Anyway, I'm giving you a lot of the background for it, but it does point out uh, the challenge that this observation was, but the Sophia team rose to it. Uh, the uh, team, you know, I think led by Paul Lucy and uh, Casey Hannibal, uh, of course, published this remarkable article. Um, it, was, it was surprising in all respects. So it is, it was a super exciting, but it came out of uh, that program where, you know, if people want to test pilot sort of a new thing, a brand new thing, that was the way to do it. So what are some of the flight plans that Sophia has done um, in, in this quest? I know that the flight plans are very extensive, um, but they're sort of out and back by long. What is the typical flight like? Um, I have to, okay, first of all, I have to say that I have yet to go on a Sophia flight. I started as a director during the pandemic, and I'm only now getting my flight credentials because, uh, because part of the safety on flight has been to, um, you know, minimize people who, um, who are on that, that aren't, aren't absolutely necessary. So I just want to put that disclaimer. However, uh, my understanding on the flight planning is uh, we have an air base, uh, the Northern, you know, we were stationed in, uh, at NASA Armstrong Air Force Base. That's in Palmdale, California. Uh, mm -hmm. They take off and they have to come back to Palmdale. Uh, so the flight pattern, um, you know, they have, an, it's, a, it's a very complex problem, but they have mastered it. They are absolute masters at figuring out how to effectively plan Sophia. But they fly out, they have their list of targets. Um, the air, the uh, telescope is only visible from the left portion of the airplane. So that determines the direction that it looks at, but they figure out the flight paths uh, and they book basically the whole flight with uh, um, science observations. Uh, the flights uh, last from anywhere from eight to 10 hours. Um, and uh, you know, they're set up in um, close time, but they have various legs and they follow a target on a particular leg. And then when they look at a new target, they you know, basically redirect the aircraft to um, a capture that target and they circle back and around. Uh, but the flight patterns uh, vary uh, depending on where the targets are. But the one constraint again is the total time and they have to get back to base. Okay. So Soraya, what, what are you looking forward to? What can you, what hints can you give us that, that you can tell us about uh, for this next few months? What, what, what can you, what can you, uh, give me, give me, the, give me some goods here. What's going on? Okay. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to put out a brochure of Sophia, you know, the remarkable results of Sophia on Sophia science, you know, over the several, past several years. And so that, that's one of the pieces that we're putting together. But as we get more and more of the results that Margaret mentioned earlier, and as we get the papers out, we will be publishing further press releases. So, um, you know, it all depends on when the paper is out, what is under embargo and so on and so forth. And uh, once we know that uh, a paper is ready to go, we will be ready to go ahead and, and work on it. So, um, so that's where we are right now. And hopefully, well, I, uh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I am, I am excited to see what's coming out. I, uh, Dr. Meixner teased at some things, so I'm really, I'm looking forward to, to seeing those results come out too. Um, yeah. I just wanna say thank you to both of you for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming in. I, again, I love Sophia. And so it's, it's nice to, to meet both of you and to have a chance to talk to you about this amazing observatory that, that just keeps going. And I'm, I'm thrilled that it's still going. Um, thank you again for joining us. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the generous donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX.